the sense of exploration and adventure is what I'm after all the time. You felt that humanity could use electronic stuff in an inventive, imaginative way for the first time, like this, to make a new perceptual universe. Mind expanding was not the word for it, you know, it actually changed me as a person. It was early 70s actually when I got here. I arrived here by a sort of circuitous route of art schools. I just wanted a sort of slightly dangerous scene, but there wasn't any. <laughs> it was just paper bags and lots of dog shit, and that was it. There was nothing on the streets, not a band anywhere. After psychedelia in Britain, England stagnated and died. When I was at art school, we were invited to an event at a neighbouring art school, which was called Happening. I had a very good lecturer called George Hoynworth, and he said, uh, where are you going? And I said, oh, we're off to this uh, event, you know. So he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, we've got some Ravi Shankar records, and we've got oily slides, you know, which were the um, psychedelic slides. That's a statement, you know. And he said, how conventional. Everyone else will be doing exactly the same thing. Don't you realise? So I said, George, what would you do? And he said, well, I would wear a grey suit. I would get four of the guys to wear grey suits, black ties, white shirts, and that would be unconventional in that context. And from that, I learned everything, just that one move. And that's what I applied when I formed Ultravox. Make a velvet underground cross with Neue for London, a sort of Shoreditch exploding plastic inevitable. This is pre-punk, it's about 1970 four or five. At first we couldn't afford the instruments and then when we started to make money we bought more gear. We kept the better stuff that made the loudest noise and then incorporated other things that made more interesting noises. They sound really interesting if you let them rip. They can take the seat out of your trousers, you know, or burn your ears out. It's wonderful. And, uh, and how were you guys received when, when punk came along? They couldn't understand why we wanted to use synthesizers. We didn't bother to explain it. There was no point. We just did it. What, what about your decision to leave Ultravox? Well, it was the end of a road. I detested the rock and roll lifestyle, you know, travelling and taking drugs and, you know, sort of incidental sex and waking up and not remembering where you, where you were. That's the most disruptive, uninteresting, devastating experience I've ever had. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I don't like getting drunk all the time. I like my sex to be sort of domestic and regular and, and fascinating and in-depth. I think I'm not built to be a, a rock star. I'm sort of normal human being, really, with some eccentricities. I decided to leave when we were making systems. So we did the tour, and then in San Francisco I said, that's it, I'm off to do my thing. You can take the name, and I'll take the drum machine. The CR-78 is the drummer. Roland had just made it, so I bought it quick. It was an earlier drum machine, which was made for cocktail lounges, because drum machines were sort of not taken seriously then. But I took them very seriously, because they could make noises that drummers couldn't. And they could stay in time as well, which is brilliant. It was new instrumentation at that time, and you had to invent a language for it, and that's the thing that gets forgotten now. Still primitive as hell, really. It, it's really a, a non-dancing Japanese synth programmer's version of Western bossa novas and waltzes. Um, so you can imagine what it sounds like. So you get these very odd, eccentric, really, rhythms out of it. But it, I find that it is like some kind of matrix that you've got, and you've got to hang other stuff on it in a way that makes some kind of sense to you at the time. So you reinvent it every time you use it, and it's just great fun for that. <laughs> but if you put that through a flanger or a, another um, sound processor, you get this atmospheric thing that gives you ideas for a song. When we were making Metamatic, at the same time, there were a lot of guys from the West Indies who were who stole on Channel One tapes. You know, Channel One's the, the uh, studio in uh, Jamaica, where a lot of early reggae was made. And they'd stolen 
those tapes or copy them, and they would bring them into Pathway, which is an eight-track studio that I made Metamatic in. And we made this record as a mode of dance. And we used to just sit, Garth and I used to sit there and think, that's the way to use a studio. Look at that. So we dubbed Metamatic when we mixed it. And on by dub, you get one instrument, make that the center of the universe, and then play with it, and then bring the next instrument in. It's like a cast of, of characters that come in through the music. That's how we made it. I use this a lot on Metamatic because you could have changed the drum machine sounds completely by just a good flanger or a phaser like that would change things. Then you bring things in manually where you want to. nothing obedient about it whatsoever. It's never made anyone dance in its life. And it's your duty to make it do it. But I mean, it's quite an interesting wrestling match you can have with the CR7 tape. If you can't get something unconventional out of that machine, you should be working at McDonald's. <laughs> and do you still use that to this day? Yeah. I can't give up CR78 because it's the basis of my music. I'd be devastated if I I mean, that was would have been quite strange at the time to, to create a, a record purely with electronic machines. Yeah, not many people had done it before, and the ones who had hadn't sold many records, so it was a bit of a risk, but I felt compelled to do it. My future is with machinery. I think Metamatic had about 500 different patches on it. There's He's a Liquid, for instance, and it's one of the sounds on He's a Liquid, because th these things have no memory, yeah. uh, these machines. Once you've got the sound, you're not going to get it again. This is the main synth that I used in Metamatic. Well, this is um, a development of this. Rather, not a development, it's a miniaturization, isn't it? This is where I came into the picture because I couldn't afford these. So they made this for every man. But lovely, painful sound. You can wreck speakers with them. This is about aggression and stage fright and distortion. I like to chain this up, you see, with lots of effects and, and things to get the sounds I want. And if you put it through an amplifier and distorted it, you could get fantastic noises out of it. And then you put echoes and effects onto it from primitive boxes. You got even more wonderful sounds. How did your involvement with Benj come about? I heard 20 Systems, which is a record he made. Benj made this recording of synths sounding like they do. The synths sounded like themselves, rather than trying to imitate something else. He just simply played and used the filters, very minimal pieces. Really beautiful pieces, actually. But it's not just technical, you see, it's a, it's a technical emotional thing, that's the point. Like that. <laughs> Great. All these sounds have an emotional correspondence, you know, otherwise you wouldn't use them. They mean something to us. He feels the same about a lot of it. That's why we can work together. You don't have to talk much, you just do it. Being in a band, it's kind of, you have to do what other people want you to do. And I'd like to just control things myself. So I set up my own studio. I mean, I, I kind of like instruments that have got like quirks to them and sort of a bit more unusual. This is the Moog Modular, which is, you know, my favorite thing in here, really. This is a 3C, it's called. It's the first modular they made in the 60s. That's the control side of it, and this is the voicing side of it. The wood is from Bob Moog's garden, apparently. Oh, Moog is Americans call it. Yeah, I never know what I had to pronounce it. How do you pronounce it? It's, it's Moog. It's not, it's Moog. <laughs> in, England, in, in England, it's Moog. Yeah. <laughs> With a W. I think, okay, yeah. Every American calls them Moog, and every Englishman calls it Moog. <laughs> very deep sounding instrument. Yeah, it's got amazing sort of rich oscillators and the filters. And 
digital equipment still trying to imitate that, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, you can't really. Which is weird. That's the mission for this generation, isn't it? To hear what digital actually sounds like without imitating analog now. Yeah. They reach parts of your psyche and parts of your memories and parts of your associations that other things can't reach, but the good stuff, the obedient stuff, the nice stuff can't reach. And it's a really interesting challenge. But it's the same when you walk into this room and look at all this equipment. You think, what, what, how do you start? What are the principles? You know? If you've done that before, you can apply all those principles into this and make something really exciting and interesting out of it too. Something that is luminous and involving and exciting and stimulating and mysterious and erotic and primitive and beautiful and ecstatic. It's those basic exciting things that we all want. We want things to trigger those things off in us. And I do too. Because that's what human life's about, isn't it?